My name is Mike Carson. How many people in here know who I am? Okay. For the majority of you that don't know who I am, uh, just to give you a, a little insight on who I am, I have a slide for you. I'm an extension developer, uh, website developer uh, with JumlaShowroom.com is one of my primary sites and ITDWebDesign.com. I've been developing in Joomla since the Mambo days, so I'm very, very involved with the code and everything, so, and the community. I'm also a Joomla Chicago user group founder. We have the largest user group in the entire United States, in Chicago, and we actually have three user groups there now, and I run our South user group. I'm also a member of the Joomla events team. I'm an OSM board member. I'm the OSM capital committee leader currently. And I've got a long history in an automotive background. And yes, that is relevant to this. And you'll see why later. <laughs> I need to know all about you a little bit so that I know what you are about. If you can try to hold your questions until I get to certain points, it's going to make things go a lot faster. This is a two-hour presentation, and it's we're going to have some questions and interactions and feedback, you know, and learn from each other a lot in this. So, at certain points, we'll have areas of discussion. We'll talk about what the first, what the three different types of requests are, and from your perspective. What are the three types of requests that you think you get? And I guess I'm, I'm going to ask you, because we're going to define those really quick, and this is the fastest part of the session. So uh, a lot, what I've found in presenting this over the past year is I find that a lot of people don't really understand the differences between the types of requests that they get. So how many requests do you usually get? get a month to help me gauge what more of your level ex of experience is. So how many of in, you in here are strictly programmers that just do programming for your own personal projects? OK, site developers? OK. Uh, how many of you work for another company and you do a lot of Joomla work or some Joomla work on the side? Okay, or Joomla work in your company, so like administrator level, more or less. Okay, this is very focused on how to deal with the clients and the requests that you get, and then we'll talk about proposals. And basically, I'm going to interact with you on how to make your proposal writing process better so that you can deal with that client better and tailor your help them tailor their proposals to what they actually need not what they think they need and how you as a provider can get the most bang for your buck as far as selling them and turning them into a long-term client and making even more money long term than you would when you just respond and do a single project for them so let's talk about request for information first. This is the most basic. I'll go through this pretty quick because I, the contracts part is where a lot of questions will happen. So that'll be more interactive than this. Request for information is usually submitted when clients looking for help just to identify a problem that they might be having. They, at that point, they're just looking for some very basic consultancy type work. They're usually the types of requests that are that a company has gone to an agency for and wants that agency to go out and see what the vendor marketplace is like for what their pro potential project is going to be based on and see if there is a viable market that's local that can that they can reach out to to present a proposal to or if they have to go outside their local market to do that. A lot of times it's used for a 
pre-qualifier on who they are going to approach with an actual proposal. And it usually helps them somewhat. The next one is a request for quote. This is still not the most primary one that we usually get. A request for quote is usually a shorter document, gives you very basic uh, information on what they might be looking for. It's usually a part of a request for a proposal. Okay, so a request for a proposal can have all three types. It's usually really basic. They want to know basic uh, pricing structures that you may have for your general tax. What do you charge for server administration? What do you charge for uh, regular site development? What do you charge for programming services? They're usually very price focused and not so much about all the details. They don't, they don't want you to start asking. So it's very important to know how to respond. Okay, it's, it's good for me to gauge that because I get 30 to 50 per month, 30 to 50. I get, I get a massive amount and because I get so many, I mean, I get, I get some really small ones, you know, and I get some really large ones. So I see the full spectrum range of requests and that's actually when I started getting to that level of volume. And uh, are we good? Okay. No, because of a lot of those come through Joomla Showroom, and they might be, you know, some ex extension modifications, things like that. Not full-blown massive projects, you know. So I get some small. I get, I get a huge range of things where more of an agency might get just the larger ones and they, they would never see those little. I've got a lot of experience from the smallest to the largest very, very consistently. What's the range for them? Let's try to make I, I could get something from 500 okay. to 50,000 yeah. US dollars. So. Um, or or more. I mean, I've I've quoted a million and a half dollar project before. So, yeah, that was tough. <laughs> we'll talk about that more in the next section. But uh, you know, so so I mean, those types of ranges, my agency and companies have have the capacity to get that range of type of quotes. So, in requests. So I've seen a lot of range. Um, that's what caused me to put this together because I have researched the living hell out of this for years, you know, looking for information on how to speed things up. And when you're, I mean, for those of you that, that are getting 10 a month, that's quite a bit, you know, so don't let me make it seem like, you know, I, I do this much. 
that's a, that's a really good amount. So the types of requests that you get so you don't waste your time. That's the point of slide. So the RFQ can be more service oriented. They're just trying to figure out what kind of services do you offer, things like that, okay? So that they know for their vendor selections to put people on the short list and weed out a lot of the some mom and pop stores if they want somebody professional that has an office of staff you know they're just trying to find out more about your company is what it is so when you reply to these give them only the information they're looking for so the if you, sometimes if you give them too much information you know it can bump you out of that you know give them exactly what they're asking for and that's it okay that's the best way that you're going to be able to get on their short list this is the big guy that you usually see okay as I said it can also have the other two into this one proposal okay request so I guess I guess you just need to learn to read what comes in you know and how professional your clients are you know because you, a lot of people may just ask you for information via email that would just the way I consider that is a request for information you know and that's all I'm gonna give them is some basic information I'm not gonna ask them for a requirements document at that point you know so it's where this is where you're going to offer solutions to what the clients requirements are they may have already hired an agency to do the other two types of proposals and you may not have ever been a part of that okay and they may have already done a short list and then found you after that so at that point they may have a full request for a proposal which is what in my case I I love getting these because somebody else has done all the legwork okay <laughs> and I didn't have to coach my client to do this unless it's a really shitty one and you know I have to coach them on how to make it a nice one you know and ask a million questions so RFPs are usually pages a lot of requirements they're obviously used for competitor analysis and they take the most time to create my advice is if you have a company come to you that has not gotten to this point and they want you to help them after talking to them to try to get them to this point that's a service you need to charge for that consultation because at that point it's a consultation okay and you should not do that for free and you need to have that type of conversation with the with the client in my opinion that's what I do and when you, it all depends on how you approach them and say well we will consult with you to identify your needs and requirements and your you know like a SWOT analysis Any, is anybody not familiar with what a SWOT SWOT analysis is okay so I don't have to explain that good so make sure you're getting paid for what you do usually the RFP should have some set deadlines and detailed requirements for both questions responses structures and submission requirements so if it doesn't have that I don't consider an RFP I consider it an RFQ okay so that last line here you know is key to identifying what an RFP and an RFQ what the differences are okay and I'd probably say 50% of the uh, quote requests that I get probably don't have this and I have to go back to them and say do you have these yet you know have you set budgets and submission timelines and things like that and if they say we have no clue now I automatically know it's not an RFP it's it's more basic so I can then work with them and now I have an opportunity to consult with them and get charge a, charge a consulting fee up front to help them a little further along in the process and the good thing about that is if you charge them and here's the reason I charge for them 
for the consulting of it is I may not be the end vendor that's chosen in the end. So if I do that for free, I've just wasted a lot of time. So um, that's something to definitely consider. I don't like wasting my time for free. All right, qualifying these things. We already talked a little bit about it. You do not have to respond to everyone. How many of you do this and feel like you're obligated to respond to every single one? Good. Oh, yeah, that's right, that latecomers. Don't do that. You can, you can reply with an email and say, it's out of our scope. We're not interested. We don't think we're a good fit. Don't feel bad about that, okay? Don't feel obligated. But, I mean, you should at least reply to the people and let them know instead of just disappearing. Look at how the RFP was distributed. Does anybody know what I mean by that? What, what do you think I mean by that? Okay. First thing that I look for in reference to how it was distributed, was it just posted on a website and I just found it? Okay. To me, that's the worst. Okay. Because it's, it's so massively publicly put out there and all these RFP databases like RFPDB.com and DesignQuote net and all these other ones that are similar to that they've got crawlers that go out there they can scan these PDFs and in web pages and they look for these keywords and they have alerts and that's how they get these things into their database so that they can make money so when that happens it's it's it goes at the bottom of my barrel you know bottom of my bucket so if it was a referral from a friend or they directly came to me you know, if they directly came to me, they've somewhat pre-qualified me, you know, and have an interest in, in me, in my company. So, you know, think about things like that. Uh, was it, prov when I say provoked in this slide, did I go out and provoke them? Did I see somebody and overheard them talking? I entered did I actively go out and seek them? Did I do local phone calls? things like that, local market. You know, they found me on the net and just submitted, you know, they're just randomly submitting requests all over the internet. This is really key. Are you allowed to talk to someone on the phone? This seems really stupid to even have in here. But you don't know how many people, I don't know what your experience is, but you don't know how many people put directly in their RFP that email only. And as soon as I see that, I email them back and I say, I know you said email only, but I would like to know who the point person is and if they have a direct line so I could discuss this further. 90% of those types of uh, replies that come back to me in that case Realistically, 90% say no. They're instantly out. Because if I cannot physically talk to a person, okay, then that means I cannot get quick answers and that they're not serious in being one of my partners, okay? Um, I don't look at my clients as customers. I look at them as ongoing long-term partners. So how are questions handled? I should be able to pick up the phone or email an individual versus an, you know, a general info or, you know, admin type email, you know, so, or an RFP at, you know, which is, I've seen that a lot too. So, uh, find out how the questions are, are handled as far as the answers. Uh, there's some good and bad in this, in my experience. I've been one of the shortlisted vendors out of, say, a pool of five vendors. And I'm the only one that asked the right questions. And they publicly say, you have two weeks to ask your questions. And at the end of that two weeks, we're going to publish the answers to all the questions that came in from all the vendors. And I did that once. My questions were the only ones published. And I thought, shit, 
none of the other guys were smart enough to answer, ask the same questions as me in the same way or whatever it is. And now they just got all the answers to my questions. So that, in that aspect, it can hurt you, okay? There's no real advice that I could give you to say do or don't in that case. You know, it's, it's, it's a risk, but you have to take that risk. But you have to ask, how are they going to do this? Are they only going to respond to yours, or are you going to see others, you know, as well? So it's, it's a valid question for you to ask. Make sure that your skills are matched to the requirements. That's the big thing. That's, that goes back to you don't have to respond to every single one. So focus on the RFPs that you have a 50% chance or higher at getting. Anything less than 50% chance, don't bother with it. You're going to waste your time. 99% of the time you're wasting your time. Okay? Either because of your skill set, you know, your employee capabilities, your resources, time, you know, everything. I mean, look at everything and just kind of say, I feel that I have a 50% chance of getting this. You know, the, maybe you have some inside information or you ask the question, how many? I'm asking. Sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they won't. You'll be surprised. You know, it's the. If you don't ask, you don't get. I've learned to ask every single time, you know, so in, in most cases it will benefit you. A potential client that's pre-qualified to a friend of mine or a partner of mine and know that they've got it if I don't have time for something and help them out rather than just tell them I don't have the time and they just go and find someone else who might be a, more of a direct competitor of mine, you know, and steal a potential job in that way. I'd rather see a friend get it, you know, or somebody that I know is qualified to do the job. The second part of that is that potential client is going to think a lot more highly of you because you just didn't leave them hanging out there, you know, in, in the field and uh, with no more research, you know, so that's kind of the things that I do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because you know, emails are so cold that that line of communication, it's it's so stone cold, you know, there's no emotion to it there, you know, or misread emotions. So, you know yourself when you meet someone face to face or talk to them on the phone, you have a completely different concept of, you know, who that person actually is as opposed to who you thought they were. You know, so it, it helps a lot, and you can, you know, they can read your demeanor, you know, and keep in mind, you're also pre-qualifying them, too. You know, just because they're a client and they have money doesn't mean that they're a good client, you know, and, you know, they don't want to deal with a bad vendor, and you shouldn't want to deal with the bad client. So it works both ways. So, you know, it's like going to a job interview. You know, you're not the only one on trial. They, you should be pre-qualifying, you know, that employer as well to make sure you're a good fit and they're a good fit for you. Yeah, we, we often ask them why they don't need any work in their current development. Yeah. And often if they say that it's because they were crap or because they fell apart, that's a hard one for us. Right. They need to say bad at work for this job. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk later. Another another word is we had to sue the last developer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> All right, see ya. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> All right, let's talk about proposals. Uh, this is the money, the money part that a lot of people get excited about. So, general guidelines always include the cover letter. How many of you include cover letters? Cover letter is a a basic 
thank you for giving us the opportunity to respond to your request. You know, um, just just uh, maybe a paragraph of text. You know, uh, it was nice talking with you on the phone. It was nice meeting with you. You know, at the coffee shop. You know, things like that. Just it's a it's a way to make it a little bit more personal and thank them right up front for the opportunity and show some type of appreciation. You know, things like that. Uh, I've I have found that probably adds a 5% to 10% increase in being able to sell that myself to them, just having that one thing, you know, versus other people that don't do it. Know that the people that are looking for your services, they don't care as much about what you can do um, and your abilities as much as they care about how well you can understand what they need, okay? That took me years and years, and I, early on, I failed miserably at it. You know, because I thought, man, I can, I can build you anything that you want. You know, but I wasn't listening to their needs, and you know, you end up building the wrong thing. You know, or a solution that, you know, and you kind of build yourself and in, into a corner. You know, and you have nowhere to go. It's just, it's 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 good to know you know this being here and presenting this here it's the first time I've presented it outside the United States so this is the type of feedback that I'm hoping to get is going to be is going to increase uh, and make this presentation a lot better because I'll be able to get some worldwide feedback, which is good. So, and it's good to know some comparisons. Yeah. yeah. All right. Make sure you're always direct and to the point. Don't sugarcoat things. Don't put fluff. Just say it like it is. You know, black and white because that's what they want. They don't care about anything else. You know, they want they want someone that's just gonna tell them you know what it is you can offer what you feel that they need and take it from there okay this is really key make it look professional and when I say that it's more along the outline okay um, make sure that at least maybe your page has some borders you know you know just a, a single or double line border you know can make all the difference in the world you know I'm not talking like you know lace fringe looking things you know or you know colored paper backgrounds or anything like that that you may have to mail to somebody but you know just just make it very organized and very structured and easy to read you know so it looks professional you know just like a website needs to be you know n not so much clutter and just maybe not so plain you know you just don't want it to be on a white sheet of paper and that's it you want to have some color to it with your logo you know so um, I've, I've found that that has helped when I've done things, you know, when I started making it, thing, redesigning my RFPs, you know, templates and things like that. It helped make a sale, you know, and you wouldn't think that it has that much of an impact, but it does. Never, ever, ever overpromise yourself. Ever, 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 ever. Because <laughs> you will burn your butt every time. I mean, I mean, every single time. Lisa, that's been my experience, and the feedback I've gotten from my audience in giving this presentation, it's been their experience as well. So I threw that in there. Does anyone know what I mean by submit just in time? Or anyone have any assumptions what they think that means? Okay. If you have, if you receive an RFP and they give you 30 days, or 45 days to submit that RFP and it takes you three hours to write it and you're done 
say, you know, you're a month ahead of schedule, would you submit that? How long, how long do you wait? Okay. A day before? <laughs> yeah. The reason I would never wait a minute before is because email is unreliable. You know, forms are unreliable. You know, mail is unreliable. You know, there's there's things that can happen, you know, in that. So you have to have a little bit of buffer room in case they didn't receive it and you don't get an email response back saying, thanks, I got it. You know, the next day follow up and say, I just wanted to make sure you got it. Always follow up, okay? J maybe a day is pushing it. That's 24 hours is probably a threshold of, of danger, okay? Submitting just in time for me, if I have 30 days, just in time to me would be two, three days, you know, range, okay? And the reason for this is they may have 20, say, say it's a big job and they've got 20 vendors that they contacted, okay? And think if you were that company receiving 20 different RFPs over a month, which one are you going to remember? You're going to remember the last one you read or the last couple that you read. And they're the ones that are going to stick in your mind the most. I don't care if they've read the other ones 20 times over a month. They're going to remember the most freshest one in their mind. Okay? Um, I, can, I can guarantee it. I've looked up st statistics on this and uh, trends and human, you know, thought processes. And it's a proven fact in, that can be backed up. So submitting just in time with a buffer to follow up to make sure they've got it is the best possible way to be, you know, the forefront of all the rest. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you know this very basic proposal outline. Not every single thing. I don't, I don't put every single thing in all of my contract or all of my proposals every single time. My introduction pages, the only one that I don't include all the time is a non-disclosure agreement. You know, half, half the time they're meaningless. Who cares? Um, but the other three, I definitely, every single time, have those. I always... I did that and had an agency or a consultant come in and help them with the professional RFP. Or it's a smaller job. I may not need to do that. If it's a, more of a mid-level range type job, normally I would, I would do a SWOT analysis in there based on my views. And when you do a SWOT analysis, it proves to them that you listened and that you had the ability to understand their needs. Okay? So that will reinforce that part of it. I may do a solution strategy separate put that right in the scope and and I just title it as a scope uh, actually all three of these you know sometimes and then I include the cost summary obviously I try to include the cost summary towards the end of those because a lot of people get sticker shock because they don't they see the price before they see what they're getting for the price you know so um, it's like going to a car dealership and yeah I'd like to see you know this type of car yeah it's 20,000 euro and okay, well, what am I getting for that price you know so you know some people may say I, I I don't have that budget you know so you have to be careful where and strategically place your pricing and cost summaries I always include you know my company information you know basic portfolio things like that. Um, the appendix pages depends if, on the, what the requirements are for the project. They may want a reference document, you know, referencing uh, what points in your proposal correspond to what points there are in their RFP, 
you know, so that's just going to be the requirements of the RFP are going to depend on those pages. So not everyone will need that. I got a couple of proposal tools that I have found extremely, extremely useful. Proposalkit.com is probably the absolute best resource out there. Uh, I want to say it's a little over a hundred U.S. dollars for uh, one of their. They've they've got different packages, but it also includes contract packs, you know, uh, government grant uh, templates and documents, and it's it's basically a package of about three thousand documents, you know, cat, all categorized into different things, and proposal outline templates for. Anything from SEO services, hosting services, um, you know, construction contract, even, you know, I mean, it's it's a huge amount of information, but you can look through all this and piece it all together, you know, and and it's all in you know basic Excel and document format, so <coughs> it's pretty nice. Um, the proposal wizard is just basically a macro program that they wrote so it's Windows only but um, as you can see it's I just put some basic features up here <laughs> I mean I could have made like 10 slides out of the features that they have so it's some research well I've taken it and I've custom developed my own standard templates like multiple ones that I use, you know, depending on the services that I have, a template for basic SEO services, web development, ongoing maintenance, software development, um, marketing, you know, and another one for hosting. So um, I, I started out using it, you know, for probably a couple, two, three months. And over that time, I was able to build my own temp, you know, common template that I found you know, I'm using a lot of this stuff, you know, more common every single time. So I, I built my own template based on all the things that they had and my contracts the same way. So it's, it's a really good resource. It's, it's worth the upfront money just to have access to the massive amount of, you know, data that they've put together, you know, and examples that they have. So. And would the contract be in Yes. They actually, it, they had U.S. and European, so in U.K. specific, so it was really good. I was, I was very impressed to see that. <coughs> okay, let's talk about things that you normally don't charge for, but you should, okay? How many of you charge separately for ongoing maintenance and updates? You would be surprised how many people don't, Okay. Um, and just assume that once they built the site that they have to just take care of it, you know, and that that client is theirs forever and they're, they're obligated. You'd be really shocked at, at how many people do that. Um, I always do a separate contract for that. You know, I do a site development or a software development contract, and then they sign a maintenance one after that. So backup services. How many of you install Akiba on every site that you build? Okay, you just, do, do, have you ever thought to tell the client, you know, versus, now here's some basic backup functionality, but we also offer some backup services, you know, maybe by using Akiba Pro and off-site backups? I do, because that turns into a hosting fee at that point, you know, and it's a monthly recurring charge. You know, I charge them, you know, five bucks, use Amazon, and I get charged 20 cents. So I... <laughs> you know, run a simple cron that's super cheap to set up and, you know, or, or nothing to set up, why, why shouldn't you try to use that as an upsell and get paid for it? It's just another service that adds to your bottom line, recurring revenue, okay? Recurring revenue is the best revenue of, in the world, you know, so offsite backups, SEO services, a lot of this stuff is common sense. Uh, Extension styling, this is a big one. You know, um, if you're building a, a less costly site and you're using third-party templates versus a custom template because of their budget, you know, and or they requested a certain template, 
you know, and you install, you know, the extension that you discussed with them would fit their needs, such as a blogging tool, you know, or a, a gallery, and it just doesn't look all that right in the template, if that's going to take you more than a certain amount of time to, to tweak a couple of things, you should charge for that. And you should let that client know up front that sometimes extensions look different in their demo or based on the template that's used. We all know that, right? But it's something that a lot of people don't think about. Content creation is a big one, you know, that we get paid for. Security service is huge. And they don't even know that they need it, okay? <laughs> and it's, it's the hidden gem. That's, that's the hidden gem of money because you can offer some ongoing ser uh, services for security monitoring, um, downtime monitoring, things like that. And, you know, they may not even have a clue that they potentially need that. So, and usually it's, I hate to say it like this, but I don't know any other way to say it. It's usually a scare tactic sale. You know, I mean, once you, you can very easily scare them into using that service, but I don't feel so bad when that happens because I know they need it, you know, um, most of the time, especially if their server is, you know, something that's not well maintained, you know, things like that. Uh, all these basic things, you know, are things that you can charge for. So, I mean, rather than me just repeat them, they're there. I mean, it's, it's common sense things, but I want to reinforce that you should be charging individually for these, you know, versus just packaging it all up and making the assumption that it's all included because you would be surprised at how much more money you will make if you break things out, you know, separately. And then at that point, you have just given them the opportunity to scale their budget. Okay, and you you just gave them the opportunity. I'm not really interested in SEO. Things like that, you know. So at least at least they know it's available to them, and it's something you you can follow up based on your discussions with them. Here's where the automotive industry background comes into play. Back in the day, there was a study conducted, a 20,000 US dollar car. It was a Ford Taurus that they did this study with. It, you could buy it for $20,000. You go to the dealership, and if you paid suggested retail price for the parts individually, that's what it would cost, 125000 That's without paint and labor to put the car together, and you still would never have a complete car because they cannot sell you the, f the full floor pans and chassis and dashboards and firewalls, things like that. So it's an astronomical increase, and it's, it's auto manufacturers make a hell of a lot more money on the parts than they ever do on the car. They anticipate you wrecking your car. They anticipate you needing to fix that car and sell those parts. And that's why they sell the cars so much cheaper than what the markup is on the parts. Okay, so does that make sense to anybody? So selling services separately is the same, same exact concept. Okay, you sell a part of a car separately, you make more m money on that part than you did when you drove it off the showroom floor all day long. So you don't have to pay a salesman, all that things. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. They make a hell of a lot more money on parts because it's a separate individual thing. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this was the best example that I could get across, you know, to, to help you understand how breaking things up, you'll make a lot more money, especially if they can't afford it up front they can do it over time, you know? And if, if you say it's a, a $5,000 website to build, 
and their budget's four thousand dollars you can scale back and say we're not going to include any of this you know and we're going to build your site for four thousand dollars and you know in the normal world what i see people doing is they'll build that four thousand dollar site turn it over to the client they'll never deal with them again they'll you know they they assume that they've done their job and everything's done but now if you've talked and talked to that client and you followed up with them about that other thousand dollars that you originally quoted them maybe in six months they can do 200 or 500 or a thousand and by the end of that year you still made the same five thousand dollars you originally thought that they would have never been able to spend and that they thought that they would never be able to afford to so it's it's a sales tactic that you need to start looking at if you're not already <coughs> bottom line is price doesn't matter when you know the budget um, a lot of clients don't how many people ask for the budget and the client just doesn't want to give it to them okay um, what how do you get them to tell you the budget let me ask that Sometimes I might say, if you want to get through this process quickly, you need to tell me, otherwise we're going to take too much time, I can't fix it, or we're going to nab this problem. And sometimes I'll say there's a website or there's a solution for every budget. You need to there is. Me, otherwise I can actually tell you something that you can, that you can afford. Exactly. I, I, I usually tell them, if I don't know what you can afford, I don't know what you need. Yeah. It's that simple. And... and true story I had this woman come to me she refused to give me her budget nice lady you know just flat out refused and I helped her a little bit put put a, uh, some polishing touches on our RFP I responded ten thousand dollars she literally called me at nine eight or nine o'clock at night crying on the phone so upset she was crying because she could only afford three thousand dollars and I said, see, now you know why I wanted to know. And I use that exact example when I'm talking to my clients trying to get the budget. And I just tell them and, you know, and joke around with them, I don't want you to call me crying. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and usually, usually it gets their guard down, you know, and things like that. But you can work the other way, too. Yeah. I wrote a $40,000 quote that was a very realistic quote for a large company and I sat down and met with them and I asked on a, on a separate project that they were hiring me to do and this was a secondary project that I had quoted in their office I said what's going on with your intranet solution that I quoted you for and we're not really gonna do that we're gonna go with uh, with Oracle and I'm like what yeah it's six figures but it just you know your pricing just didn't seem like it was gonna be the solution I'm like my pricing didn't seem like it was gonna be the solution <laughs> you know and I and I said well what's different between the solution I was gonna give you take the pricing out and he says it's about the same I'm like what the hell are you thinking yeah. you know and he had no answer it's exactly what saying, I don't but they did it anyway <laughs> They think, yeah, they don't, they don't see you as a serious player in the industry, and they don't, you know, and I, and I start thinking, damn, I need to hire their salespeople because I'm doing something wrong, you know, and it's like I feel guilty telling, telling somebody, you know, six figures for a forty dollars or $50,000 project, but, you know, it's, it's realistic, and I, and I said this is because I'm using open source versus proprietary. That's the only difference. You know, and some of these enterprise corporations, they're in that enterprise world and they just don't get it, you know, and you'll never change their mind. So um, it's, it's just the way it is, you know, unless you're dealing with open source and enterprise solutions, offering those to your clients, that's the only way you can combat that, 
you know. Right. Exactly. So the budget can always be adjusted. We all know that. Um, only include the essentials if you can, like we said. Upsell everything separately when possible. Break the project out into phases and make them into a long-term client, okay? When I tell them, you know, um, you know, your budget is only this much, why don't we give you your bare bones needs and not give you your, your nice haves, you know, or your, your total vision now so you have a product to launch, you know, uh, a site to launch and get your business rolling, you know, so you can start getting some return on your investment. And then we'll do this in phase two and this in phase three. 90% of the time when I use that, they appreciate that I was considering their budget number one, and they know that they can add on later and turn it into an ongoing project as they can afford it. So my clients absolutely love it when I do these, you know, phase proposals like that. Here's a big one. That's why it's in caps. People don't ask for the damn job. You know, they just submit it and they, they don't tell them, I really want to be the vendor of choice. Why the hell wouldn't you tell people that? You know, you want the job, you just spent, you know, an hour or, you know, I've spent 16 hours putting one proposal together once, you know, and just, just writing it, not doing all the, the research and cons consultations beforehand. So, I mean, why would you not just come right out and say, I'm going to be the vendor of choice. You're going to hire me. And just be that bold about it and just tell them, I'm the right guy. You know, I'm the right solution for you. I'm the right business. And, you know, and just be that confident. You know, what is wrong with that? You know, and it works. It really, really works. And make sure you thank them for the opportunity. That's key because they will remember that. Okay? Those last two points, they'll definitely remember. And make sure if you don't get the job, follow up and find out why. Because if you, you don't know what's broke, you can't change it. Okay? You can't fix it. So find out where you fell short, you know, why somebody else was chosen. You know, it's that simple. Most people will be quite frank and tell you, you know. Questions at this point? This next session, I'm going to have to cruise. <laughs> we all good? Okay. How many of you write contracts for every single job that you do? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I like to use the 80-20 rule. Listen 80% of the time, talk 20%. You know, when you do that, it's, it's better, you know. <laughs> we are, but if, if you can go into it and remind yourself, you know, right before a meeting or a phone call, um, we'll wait here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. If, if you have to go in with that mindset, you know, ahead of time, just, you know, and then remind yourself halfway through again, you know, because you can get caught up in the moment, right? So, welcome. Yeah. More than they talk about their ambitions. 
Well, it's, a, it's, it's the same concept as asking for the job. Have the balls to ask for the job. Maybe that's what they're doing that you're not, you know, when you're not getting it. So. Right. And those days at any one team can stand it. And uh, they don't, don't say the buzzer. Like you said, they try to uh, pull up information to you. And uh, if I, anymore, if I get someone who refuses to tell me the budget at all or even give me a hint, I flat out tell them, then how can I offer you any solution at all? I'm sorry, I just can't do anything for you. You will not give me the information that I need, you know, to help you, you know, and, and be your vendor. You know, what if I did just refuse to give you my pricing, my hourly rate, you know? You know, what if I refuse to tell you how many employees I have? You know, would you want to work for me? You know, and usually when you use that kind of, you know, you propose that to people, they start thinking, eh, he's got a point, you know, so... You know, use some tactics like that, you know, and change the perspective. Because yeah, they're not the seeing it that way. To understand which point uh, really right. uh, is motivational for your client uh, to, to move from an entity to your entity. Right. So it's very difficult. And sometimes you think that it's Joomla based, but many times it's not. Sometimes you think that open source matters for them. Mm -hmm. They don't care if it's open source. Mo most people don't care what the solution is. They care that they get a solution that they can afford, yeah. period. Yeah, yeah. Okay? It's, it's the right... I, do I believe that Joomla is the right tool for every single client, every job? Hell no. No way. Not even for my own private projects. No way. This, this is the tool I believe is the best fit for you. Now, in, in my mind, in, in my world, you can do anything with Joomla. You can do anything with Drupal. WordPress is whatever, in my opinion. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the lower, cheaper, quick and dirty solution for most people, you know, that need simple solutions, you know. But um, I know Joomla a hell of a lot better than I know Drupal. So for me it, and the client, that's a better fit, you know. So that's what I propose, you know. Or if there's a commercial solution, enterprise solution, that I think is a, a better fit for a certain task, or if they're looking for a project management system or an ERP system, do I think Joomla is the right choice for that? No, not at all. I really don't, you know. So I'll offer them some other solutions, you know. Um, Big, huge e-commerce sites. Do I believe Joomla is a solution? No, not in a million years. You know, because I truly don't feel that Joomla e-commerce is there yet. And I don't see it happening in the next two years either. So, you know, um, I have to look at that when I'm talking to them. I may offer them something, you know, a standalone project, you know, for e-commerce. You know, things like that, whether it's open source or, or proprietary. So... It's the best tool for the job, bottom line. So, um, you know, that's where we're at. So I'm going to continue. We only got 45 minutes. And my clicker stopped. All right. <coughs> Basic Contracts 101. Uh, this is what separates the amateurs from the professionals. I don't know any other way to put it. Okay? If you're not writing contracts... In my eyes, you're an amateur. I'm going to be blunt. I'm from Chicago, and I say it like it is. You know, if you don't like it and I'm offending you, good. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm sorry, and I never will. Um, I said the same thing to Paul Orwig when he sat in this presentation a year ago. He was at the back of the room, and I said, amateur. You know, and I called him out. So um, I, don't, I don't have any problem saying that very boldly. You know, you have to protect your ass. Bottom line, you know, this is your business. This is your life. You can be put out of business with one lawsuit. 
Does everybody in this room realize that no matter how big your business is or how small it is, one lawsuit will put you out of business? It, I mean, that's a fact in its reality. It's going to keep both parties accountable, okay? It, and that's how I present it to my clients. When they're weary about a contract, you know, some of the smaller clients may not want to sign a you know, three to five or seven page contract, you know, or 10 page contract, whatever it ends up being. You know, I just tell them, this is much for your protection it is for mine. You know, it's beneficial to both and holds us both accountable. It's not a matter of trust. You know, if, if you know, a good friend of mine or a family member wants me to do something for them, do you think I'm gonna have them sign a contract? Hell no, I'm not gonna have them sign a contract because I'd never do work for my friends and family. <laughs> I learned that the hard way, and I refuse to ever do it again. I, I don't care how much money they've got in their pockets. They can hire an agency, and that agency can hire me. <laughs> so I never start a job without one. I have people sign a contract for $200 jobs, you know, extension, little things. You know, I've got a template. It take, I have to put their name and a price on it, and it's done. You know, and I send it to them. It takes me no time at all, you know, when you, you've got your template basic templates set up and you know and they're like it's only two hundred dollars I don't give a shit you know I want to make sure I get my two hundred dollars you know for the work that I'm gonna spend you know so this is a major one here get an attorney it is your business bodyguard if you think that an attorney how many of you have not hired an attorney because you think it's too expensive and you can't afford it and I I've seen one hand go up, so that means a lot of you are lying to me. <laughs> and don't feel bad about raising your hand. I just want to gauge the audience. How many of you, seriously, have not hired an attorney to review contracts or legal things in your business? Okay. I'll give you a true story that happened to me two years ago. I had been writing all my own contracts. I thought I was doing a great job. And I had a client that um, it actually worked out very well because I had just built an attorney's website. And I was just finished with it when this happened. And my wife also works for an attorney, which is ironically, I never went to him. So uh, I had a client that owed me I think it was a $2,700 job or $2,800, $2,800 is what it was. I originally went to my, my attorney and asked him, I said, I have two major contracts that I want you to review. How much? He said $600. I said $300 each to review the contracts, and I knew he wouldn't change much at all. You know, in my mind, I knew he wouldn't. And I'm like, wow, that's seems to me like quite a chunk of change to shell out just to look at you know 20 pages worth of documents and 20 pages? It, well yeah like 10 pages pages each for each contract you know I just wanted them to review each one and just give me some advice you know not even to write them up just give me advice you know where am I weak and what do you think is missing type things and so I didn't do it Two months, you know, I built this the same attorney site. You know, he came. That's how I met him and ended up building his site is by approaching him to review these contracts. He signed those identical contracts that I didn't have him review, <laughs> and uh, he he didn't even remotely question them whatsoever when I did the work for him. You know, it was only you know four thousand dollars at the time, so I, I didn't think much of it, but. Uh, I had this other client, $2,800. And she approved to do all this work. And I, t I gave her estimated hours, you know, and she's like, yeah, go, 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 go. And we're rapidly doing all this stuff. Well, I sent her the invoice at the end of the month. I never thought it would be that high. And she's blowing her stack, bitching. And I started looking at all of our, our documentation in my project management system. And I said, and I, you know, I took screenshots and I said, Look at these estimates, you know, and that you approved. You, you've done all this, and I have documentation of it. She said, I'll give you $1,900. I 
or 1800 It was like $1,000 less. So I went back to the attorney and I said, this is the situation. She's refusing to do it. I have a contract signed with her. I said, what do I do? What are my next steps? I've never had this happen to me. And it's the only time it's happened to me ever. So he said, take the money. Believe it or not, which I thought I had to change my underwear, you know, when he said that, because it just, it blew my mind. And I said, why? And he says, your contract won't stand. He says, and I said, why? He says, I signed it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, you son of a bitch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, it, it was, it was quite funny, you know, listening to him do the, you know, tell me this. Yeah, he paid me, no problem. You know, I, I had him sign in a document that, you know, he signed off that the project was completed and delivered and anything from that point forward would be chargeable, you know, hourly things, you know, but he had no problem signing the contract because he didn't care. He knew the loopholes, you know, and he just says, uh, you could have paid me $600 to review those contracts. I would have known how to get you out of the situation and had you revise it. He says, you would have, $600, you would have never been in this position. He says, now you're $1,000 down. Your contract will never hold up in court. You're gonna spend three days in court as an average to get this handled of your time plus $250 for a filing fee. And he says, you're going to lose, period, because of your contract. He says, I don't care how much approval documentation in your project management system you have. It won't hold up in court. And so ultimately I, ex I had no choice based on his advice to accept that $1,800. So I lost $1,000 on that job and I still had to pay him $600 freaking dollars to do these contracts for me to make sure this never happened again. So $600 turned into $1,600 and a pissed off lost client. You know, so, which would have ended up that way anyway, but, you know, don't think of that cost as being a lot, because I learned the hard way. You know, it's, it's cheap, you know, spending a thousand dollars less to do the same damn thing, you know, and not go through those frustrations and hassles. So, that's just a personal experience I had that may put some things into perspective for you. I don't know if any of you have had anything like that, but... It, it, I never thought it would happen and I thought I had my butt covered and that I had done enough research and knew what I was doing, but you know, I learned the hard way. You, keep in mind you have more power than you think. When I say that, don't be, or if you're up against uh, a contract at that stage, to where you're ready to sign a contract and they just won't, uh, you know, they're not flexible on anything, you know, and um, they won't accept your terms, things like that. Be prepared to walk away, okay? You're gonna have a, when you do that, you will at least have a 50-50 chance that they will say, no, we've already committed to you, you know, now we'll be more flexible, okay? or if they're not gonna adjust, you know, or be flexible at all, and, you know, they want their own terms and, and you're, you know it's not the right thing, be prepared to walk away and just accept it, you know, that you lost some time on it and because it's gonna end up bad for you in the end, you know, if, you, if you're the only one that's flexible. So keep that in mind. You, you have a lot more power than you think. Make sure you're, you have clear expectations, clear definitions, you know, in your contract. Don't do lawyer speak. When I went to my lawyer, I said, I don't want your language. I want an English language. I want, I want five-year-old to be able to read this and understand it, you know, or fifth grade, you know, level of schooling to be able to read this contract and understand it, you know. Um, he didn't understand that, but he doesn't know the, peop the real world, you know people that you have to deal with sometimes. So make sure you always reference third party and external documents in the appendix. 
if you have to. When I say that, <coughs> one thing that I do that I should have covered in my proposals part, every single proposal I write has a uh, proposal number, an ID number, and a version number. Okay, so it'll be like 123-1, and the dash one is the version number. Okay, every single one. Okay, because if they come back and change it, I make it version two, version three, you know, we make our adjustments. Then the contract is written, and the very first page, very first line, proposal number 123 1. Okay, I reference it right there. Okay, that when you do that, that proposal now becomes part of the contract just by putting that that reference line in there okay so make sure that you and that's going to make your contract shorter because then you don't have to put all those numbers in there you know in that scope it's auto, it automatically you know absorbs into it so make sure you do that make sure you set deadlines and consequences for both of you how many of you have asked for content from a client and they haven't given it to you and it delayed the project my contract clearly states you will get dummy lipsum text in your website and that's how it will be delivered and considered a completed job if you don't give it to me by this deadline period you know and legally they have to accept it and they're they're agreeing to that term so um, you have to put some ownership on your clients and you have to have some consequences you know in it at that point you can also say if I have to write my own content because you didn't provide it, I will charge you for content creation and it will be this much. Okay, so that's another consequence, you know, and another tactic you could use for, you know, an upsell. You know, so you just have to be clearly upfront with that when you discuss everything, but make sure it's in your contract. Yeah. We'll cover that. I, well, I think where you're leading, we're going to cover some of that. Okay. So I, okay. I want I, I don't know for sure, but I want to stop you just in case, okay. and then we can discuss it afterwards. So, if you don't mind, no, no. okay. Limit the number of revisions to your contract. Why? Because then it becomes an endless, ongoing, costly problem. Okay, and it muddies the water. Things aren't clear at that point. And, you know, I, I'll say I'll do three revisions. So get your act together. You know, make sure you read it and do it right the first time. You know, and we negotiate the right, everything right the first time. You know, normally I don't have any problems with anything. So um, it's just something to keep in the back of the mind if you're doing larger clients, you know. How do you let them know about the revision? I just tell them, you know, I, I tell them right up front you know, via email or phone, you know, and usually they don't have, nobody's ever, they're like, all right, no problem, you know, and I don't have any issues. I just, I kind of got a bullet point checklist of things that I just know I need to cover, you know, based on these things we're discussing that I need to cover, you know, when we get to this point. So maintenance and technical support, make sure you're very clear in your contract what your maintenance and technical support you know, for warranties are. Um, how many of you offer, you know, a certain amount of time or ongoing maintenance after you build the site and deliver? What's your range, Sarah? What? What's your basic, um, you know, s support range limits, you know? Like time, I'm talking time. Yeah, okay. Okay. Twelve or twenty-four months. So that's your timeline, but you limit 
it by hours yep. during that time, entire timeline. Okay. You're the first one I've ever heard say that. So that's that's very interesting and kind of like it. Anybody else? Included as in the price was bumped up yeah. to adjust for that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. What do you do? Use it as they need it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's I I do that too. Prepaid support packages. Um, anyone else, real quick? Okay. I usually do. I usually just keep it kind of general. I don't limit so much hours. I just tell them I'll warranty anything for 30 days on our workmanship. You know, I'm not fixing Joomla bugs. That's Joomla's problem. I'm not fixing third-party extensions. You know, if I built a custom template and you find a CSS issue, I'll take care of it. You know, things like that. I'm not going to restyle stuff for you because you don't like the look of it. You know, and it's utterly amazing how many people do that. And I just want to grab them and smack them and say, what the hell are you thinking? You know, I mean, some of my best friends in this industry call me and they, they're just so frustrated and they're like, God, Mike, I'm, I got myself in a jam. I freaking have to deal with this, you know? And I'm like, well, that, you're a dumbass. I've told you a hundred times not to do this, you know? And people just, you know, don't get it, you know? So make sure that you limit your technical support and warranty at some point, okay? Yeah, we do. Yeah, that's that's good feedback. Yeah, uh, out, of, out of hundred hundreds of people that have seen this, you're the first that's ever said that, and you were the first that ever gave your scenario. So it's it's great feedback to know the differences. So <coughs> this is a tough one. Do any of you define copyright ownership in your contracts? You build a Joomla site. Who owns the copyright? Just, just by you looking at the ceiling thinking automatically tells me that you do not define copyright ownership. We're in a unique situation where we're dealing with open source third-party software. The client can never own that copyright, ever. They, they think that they own the copyright to that website. No, they don't. They ha if they provide it, yes. Or you have provided it and transferred that copyright ownership the to them. The design? Copyright? If they're the ones that came up with the design, mm -hmm. if they're the ones that came up with the design, and when you built that template, you didn't use any GPL code. You use a drop of GPL code on any website. All code on that website is GPL based at that point or cons or well that code is considered but if it's a part of that entire source then that source becomes GPL okay so the design, design design is in CSS and JavaScript is a little different okay so that's a little more touchy and also about like artistic design right about Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm designing something for you, and this solution that I'm doing is something that I've done, like a, an, an artist, for example, and he's owned to me, not to you, or you buy. If you want to buy, mm -hmm. you pay for it. Then you're getting into the whole Apple owns the rounded corner concept. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, I mean, realistically, that's our world, right? So, I mean, you can... It's how far do you want to push it? 
that envelope, you know, and, and things like that, because I don't care, every designer in the entire world, I don't care who it is, they've all used ideas from each other, you know, and who's to say, that rounded corner on the right side at six pixels curve, that was my idea, I was the first one that ever did that, you know, it's like, shut up, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, sometimes you have to realistically think in common sense what you're saying, you know, when, when you start talking in, about things like that, you know, and, and that goes into the code as well sometimes. They're used to proprietary systems. Yeah. Exactly. So you have to define copyright ownership. You know, um, if a client pays me, comes to me and says, I want you to build me an extension for, you know, um, my widget, you know, and I want you to build me this widget. And I'll say, okay. Um, you know, and I know they got the deepest pockets in the world, you know, budget's not an issue. I flat out ask them, copyright ownership, who owns it? And, and how much of the code? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I, of course I want the copyright ownership. Okay, it's going to cost you 10 times more than I would normally charge someone else. And they're like, well, why? You're screwing me. Because I have to make sure that I write 100% original code in JavaScript and CSS. 100%. And I can't reuse GPL, you know, extensions and convert it, you know, or the solutions available, but it just needs a few things and I can do that a lot cheaper, you know, and make it give you a solution that fits your needs based on something else or snippets of code. Um, I mean, that's our world. So, and, it, and most people don't think of that, you know, and for the first 10 years that I've been doing this, I didn't think about that until I started doing some research on it. and. And that's why I ultimately wrote all this because, you know, most people don't think about it because 90% of the people in our industry don't, you know, unless they go out and do this research, they're not going to know about it. And I'm the, I'm the only one that does this present type of a presentation in the entire world. I, I'll tell you right now, I have not found anybody else that does this and put something together to present to people, you know, based on research facts is, is more complete on this part of it, you know, and tailor it to our world. So it's definitely something you really need to think about. Okay, so yeah, I gotta hurry up. If they own the copyright and they're paying me 10 times more for all 100% original code, at that point, I hate to say it because of what's coming up, it kind of turns into a work for hire situation that you'll never legally be able to do that. They own the copyright, okay? So, and it has to be stated in the code. So, um, or documented some way in a contract, it doesn't even have to be in the code, just, just somehow defined. So, um, you just have to be really careful. You know, I'm not an expert on that. I'm not an intellectual property attorney, you know, or anything like that, but based on the research that I've done, and we have a intellectual property attorney in our user group in Chicago, you know, so I've talked to him a lot about this, and I co-presented on GPL licensing and everything with him, you know, and he says it's such a touchy situation, you know, and it's, you know, it's, people have been sued, but there's not much documented cases out there you know, and even the, the Freedom Software Law Center, they, they don't have a lot of documentation, you know, that's, you know, because it, it is so touchy and it's so gray and, you know, things like that. I mean, the, the only real documentation are people like Samsung and Apple when they go head to head, you know, you know, more proprietary type systems. So, but in our open source world, we haven't reached that level yet to where it starts hitting those enterprise levels really, really big and super widespread, maybe in another 10 years, we're gonna probably start seeing some of that. So, something to keep thinking about. What I said, the next thing coming up, <laughs> avoid that, you know? Don't do work for hire agreements, you know? Um, 
everything that I build for a client, my contract clearly states all code will be GPL. I clearly state it right up front. Whether, whether they even think about that or not, I clearly state it. And that gives me the, and that I as the, uh, the developer of that code or that design, I own the copyright. I own the licensing, or I have the choice to license it as I choose. You know, I'm just building you a solution, you know, and you're paying me to build a solution. You know, so I'm at that point, you know, you're paying me to assemble your site, you know, and put a module here, or, you know, buy this module or extension and install it. It's no different. That gives me the right to redistribute that, you know, to the world for free or pay or modify it, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's something we really haven't put much thought into. So that's why I bring it up. Three things you should never, ever, 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 ever back down from on a contract. Never be flexible on these three things. Intellectual property does not transfer until full payment. Period. Okay? So if you come up with a design for them, and that design is going to be transferred to them as their intellectual property design, not until I'm paid, damn it, because you have no leg to stand on once you do that, if you're not paid. Make sure that you have a termination or a kill fee, however you want to word it. It's, I've heard it different terms in different worlds and uh, parts of the world, so um, termination fee. Uh, you're halfway through the project, with a, a big client, the person that made the decision to hire you and do that project gets fired, dies, or quits. It's known to happen. It has happened. Um, management steps in and says, I never really believed in this thing. You know, we're going to end this now and not spend any more money on it. And you've got all these administration costs, right? you need to make sure that you're paid for the work you've done up to that date for the percentage of the work you've done plus your administration cost. Make sure you're covered for that in your contract. Liability. How much liability is on your head? You build a solution for, um, say, Philips. Okay? They've been here having their conference. You build a solution for Philips. Even if it's something really small, you build a module for them. They end up getting sued, and somebody tells them, hey, you guys are using my code in my design, you know, my JavaScript code, blah, 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 and it's proprietary and it's mine. Guess what Phillips is going to do? They're going to say, hell no, it was this guy. You did it. Are you prepared for that? Most people, I, I haven't met anybody that just said, yeah, I'm covered. I'm the only one that I know because I'm the only one that's done the research on it, you know, that I, that I know, you know. <sighs> there's, there's no clear-cut answer. Try to cover your ass as much as you can, you know. Don't wear assless chaps. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. I mean, um, there's no other way I can put it. It's... it's walking around with the butt cut out of your pants. You know, it's, yeah, I'm wearing pants, but I'm not covered all the way, you know, in, in the really sensitive areas, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, I don't, there's no real answer. I'm not, I'm not an attorney, so there's, I, I cannot give that advice, but I have to tell you to limit your liability so that you, I'm giving you the advice so that you can go and deal with this in your own company. Okay, so I mean, that's the whole idea of this. Okay, I'm I'm not here to give legal advice, you know. So I'm just giving you a lot of food for thought. List potential problems and include a clause for those problems. Okay, what happens when uh, they want to bring in a second developer on the project? How does that affect you? My contract doesn't allow a second development company unless it's someone subcontracted through me because then I can control it. 
you know, and I can control the quality of the code and, you know, they, they intrude into things that I've done and break my stuff, guess who has to warranty that, you know? So um, that's something that I, I do and it clearly states if you want to hire two development companies to work on the same project, you're going to end my contract. It's that simple. Clearly define what constitutes a completed project. How many of you have your clients sign an actual agreement that is separate from the contract that you've delivered the project and that they're happy with it and that they accept it as done? I do. And, you know, as soon as that signature's on that dotted line, my 30 day warranty, you know, or whatever your warranty is, tick tock. That's when it starts. Okay? That's, that's the proof. They've accepted it. The job is done. Okay? It's up to you and your client when that happens. But you should be doing that. Because technically, three months from or three months after you've already trained them, delivered it, and you don't hear from them, you could get drug into court and they can honestly say, we've got, you know, all these things that they said they were going to do, they never did. You know, what do you do then? How do you prove it? You know, how do you prove that they've accepted it as done? So, you know, people are very strange, you know, I mean, look, this side of the room, look at that side, and this side of the room, look at this side. You're all fucked up. I'm a fucked up. Everybody's <laughs> fucked up, right? So, I mean, <laughs> you know, this is this is going to be really good on the internet when people, you know, hear all my language. But I'm from Chicago. I don't care. But <laughs> <laughs> um, people that know me are used to it. So, I mean, it's it's reality, right? You know, and it's you just have to know it and say it. You know. People are messed up. I don't care who you are. We're all messed up, and we all think differently, and we think that we have rights to different things. You know, so. How do you get your signatures? I mean, it took me ten weeks to sign something, and then this photograph of it. Yeah, I. I mean, I. If if I'm training them in person, you know, sometimes I'll have them sign it. If it's a simple thing, you know, and the training is very simple. And they've, you know, and they've had a few days or a week to look at it before, you know, and go through the site before I've had time to train them. Um, you know, I have them sign it right there sometimes, you know. It, it all depends. Sometimes I'll have them sign it a few days after the training, you know, and have them just sign it and scan it, email it back to me or fax it back to me. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. You know, it just depends on what's going to hold up as law in your part of, of the world. So... You know, in the United States, a fax and scan document is legal, you know. So um, even even just them replying to an email and saying, I accept this, that's legal in the United States. So I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but just be current and talk to your business bodyguard. How important is the money to you? Money's pretty important to me when I got to put food on the table and pay my mortgage, you know, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? You got to, everybody's got to live. You know, it's not about spending money. I'm talking about living expense money, you know, and I'm sorry I worked too damn hard to give it all away, you know, and not be able to get what I'm owed, you know, so this, this whole contract, a contract, in my opinion, is something you should never, ever, ever have to use, ever. Okay? Ever. And that's the way I see it. But it, it's a necessary evil that you have to do because you never know when you could need it. And it only takes one time, like I said, to put you out of business. Include payment schedules on there, uh, your, your payment terms, things like that. What do you think about this? How many of you take 50% down as an average? 30? Full? You do a size? Okay. My standard is 50. Okay. If it's a very large job, I'll do a payment schedule. 
okay? But that deposit is always non-refundable. And that is on the first page of my contract, right under the reference to the, my reference to the uh, RF, or to the proposal with the version number. The second thing is payment terms and schedule. The very first line under that says non-refundable deposit of 50% in parentheses. I put the actual dollar amount of whatever that is um, due before work starts. And that's exactly how it's worded. And I've had a few people come back to me and say, wow, non-refundable, you're not kidding. No, I'm going to do your freaking job. You, you're at the contract signing point. You already told me you want me to do the job. You know, and I told you it's going to be 50% down. What's non-refundable got to do with it? You going to change your mind? Well, no. Then what's the problem? You know, and if they make an issue of it, I got red flags. And I know that I have to deal with some shit right then and there and get it done and either tell them to go to hell or sign the damn contract and let's get this done and move on. So um, it's make them commit. They want you to commit to them. Make them commit to you, period. Okay? I say, the same, I say it just like that to my clients. You want me to commit to you, you're going to commit to me. That simple. I don't mess around with it. It's not worth it. Payment terms. Who does 30-day net? This is pretty common in the, in the states. I don't know. What do you mean by that, net? 30-day net, after you delivered the final job, they've signed off, said they accept it. How long do you wait and allow them to give you payment? Huh? That day? That day? Okay. <coughs> Anyone else? 15 days? 14? Why? That's a law? Yeah, it's kind of recommendation, but we just don't bring it. It's an unspoken law. No, it's not. Okay. See, that's the kind of feedback that I like to know from other parts of the world because I only know U.S. U.S. people just assume 30 days is the standard. There's no law. It's just made up in somebody's head, and they just said 30 days because it's a month. Why? Did I wait 30 days after you paid me to start building your website? No. I... It's not supposed to be on here. <laughs> um, <laughs> now you messed me up. You got me off track. That is good. Uh, I do seven day net. Okay? That's more than enough time to get even a check in the mail and get it processed. I've only ever had one client that wanted 45 days and I got them down to 15. Did they pay me in 15? I had to remind them every freaking month at the 30-day mark that they hadn't paid me in 15, you know, and then they finally started getting things scheduled because I was the only one out of hundreds and hundreds of vendors that they had that was 15-day net. And it was pure hell getting that. But I got it because I had more power than I thought, you know, and that was part of that line that I put in this is based off of that exact situation. So there's no reason, you know, most of them, they pay immediately because I've got digital processing and invoices, so it's it's not a problem. But are you legally supposed to accept ninety days? I don't. One hundred twenty days. I don't. Okay. You you rent a car at a car rental agency. Whose contract do you sign? Yours or theirs? Why? Do you like all their terms? No then why don't you write your own damn contract and make them sign it? What's the difference? You sign other people, cell phone carriers, whose contract do you sign? Yours or theirs? What's the that difference? More or less that if they have that in the requirement set when they send out the proposal, 
It doesn't. No, I answer them. Okay. I don't discuss contracts until they. I don't send them a contract unless it's requested ahead of time, and I never write up a contract and send it to anybody until they call me and say, we like your proposal for our discussions. What's the next step? Let's get this moving forward. Only then do I send them my contract because the contract does not matter one bit until they're ready to commit. And it's a totally separate, it's a totally separate negotiation than the proposal. So why would you want to conf add more confusion to a decision-making process, such as the proposal, by giving them the contract as well. That's yeah, just, a, if not more. They want you to come in when you send them the proposal. Is that, that Only if they request a copy of the contract. Okay. And then I just tell them, this is my standard template that every, every client signs. I make sure I state it just like that. Every client signs this contract. And I do not sign anyone else's contract, ever. And if they they want to bully you, hold firm. You can you can you're the service provider, okay? And and use those examples like a rental car cell phone provider. Yeah. 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 That's why I do seven day net because it's it's more than enough time. Especially we we live in a digital world. You know, some bigger clients may only pay by check processing on Wednesdays. I mean, it's just the way their business is set up, and that's the only way they can process payments. You know, so it just you know I'm flexible with it. You know, if I'm not gonna. If it comes the eighth day, I'm not pounding on somebody's door and turning off their website, you know, something like that. But, you know, it's it's general terms, you know. Right. Exactly. And and if they can, aff they should be able to afford that and budget, f you know, and realize that that expense is coming. They should know. So that's a good point. I gotta hurry up. Ex contracts are negotiable, like we said. Whose contract do you sign? We discussed. Include attorney's fees. Exclude outside vendors that compete with you, which is exactly what I discussed. Make sure you include travel, training, and consultation fees. Very important. I break the training out separately and say, for this size project, it's going to take four hours, two hours, eight hours. You know, do I have to train a whole room full of people? You know, I clearly define that and discuss that with the client and say, you know, I may want two directors. I don't want all 15 of your staff in there. You know, I'm going to train two people, and then you're going to train two people, and I'm going to give you the supporting documents to do that. You know, or I'm going to make videos, you know, and supply these videos for you. You know, so you have some reference training. You know, things like that. So, you know, um, I'm going to have you hold off for just a, a minute. Scope creep. You guys never have scope creep, right? No. So we'll skip this slide. When do you amend a contract? I amend the contract when um, adding new services. You know, um, it's the same contract. I just have add one page that states the amendments, meaning changes. That's all it is. So any anything minor, anything major, such as design and functionality changes, um, that are major. Payment schedules are renegotiated for whatever reason. You know, the project changes majorly and it causes, you know, some major delays. That's when you need to, to start thinking about ending the contract exactly where it is, starting a new one from that point forward. You know, if, if the whole project starts to veer a different direction, you know, because they realize, you know, we didn't think this through the way we thought we should have. So it happens. Uh, or if there's new major services, like like I, I originally put SEO and SEM in there, those I would just do a completely separate pro. You know, I'd keep the same contract. I wouldn't end it. I'd just create a new one for those services. So <coughs> make sure you analyze why it changed. Was it their fault? Was it your fault? You can't fix it if you don't know it's broke, type of thing. So 
you know, who missed what, you know, it's, that's going to make you do a better job, you know, and it um, doesn't matter if it's your fault or their fault, either way, it's going to make you better knowing what the uh, answer is to that. Okay, last slide. What do you do when things go wrong? Client and third party modifications. We already discussed the third party modifications. What do you do when things go wrong? Um, you got to clearly state that in your contract. If things blow up, um, does, it, does everybody live in the you know, rainbows and unicorns and butterflies world? You know, where you have perfect clients, you know, and you're blissfully happy? Um, no, we don't, we don't live in that reality. So uh, things go wrong, right? You know, not every time you get the right client. So you need to be able to pick up the phone and personally talk to someone, okay? Personally is the key word here. Make it personable. 99% of everything can get handled over a phone, not an email, not through, you know, a chat session or whatever it is. Pick up the phone and do it through the phone. You know, voice means everything because then they can, they can hear your sincerity or a face-to-face -face meeting, things like that, you know. And if, if something can't be resolved, that usually brings the buffer way down. It, you know, um, it lowers all, a lot of tensions, you know, that way too. So um, at least you can reasonably discuss things with people when things go wrong. Don't forget, you can fire your client. How many of you have never fired a client before? Ever? Really? Have we all had the same client at one point? <laughs> so, you know, it's not a one-way streak. So make sure you just do it with respect, kindly, quickly, and always in writing, okay? Because at that point, you're ending the contract. You gotta have some documentation on severing that tie, so. Have an exit clause, same thing. What happens if you end the contract? What happens if they end the contract? It's kind of like that termination kill fee. The termination and kill fee before we talked about was more on their end. Exit clause is more your end. You know, if you decide to exit this project, have a strategy, have a clause for that, what's gonna happen? Have you covered your costs? How important is the money to you? Okay, so make sure you're paid up to that point if it ends. That's all I've got. Three minutes after. I am done. I am finished.